everyone. Here we are for another video lecture. Um, I was going to try to combine chapters 12 and 13 on the immune system, but as all, all of you know from doing your concept map, there's a lot in these two chapters. Um, chapter 12 is fairly straightforward. There are a few points that I do want to hit on. So this will be a, a pretty brief presentation and then I'll cover chapter 13 more in depth. So there are some parts of this chapter that I'll gloss over because they're going to come into, into play more um, in chapter 13. So quickly, uh, section 12.1 is pretty straightforward. We look at what our host defenses are, um, specifically those the first or the three different lines of defense that we have, the first two being the innate or the part of the immune system that we are born with. If something's in, innate, it means we're born with it. Uh, and here they are. Our uh, first two lines of defense are nonspecific, meaning it doesn't matter what gets in. It doesn't matter what tries to get in, what comes at us. Uh, there's no specificity. If it doesn't belong, we uh, prevent it or prevent it from getting in or attacking it, attack it. The third line of defense, our acquired immune system or adaptive immune system is specific. It recognizes, it learns and recognizes and remembers invaders. Um, so our first line of defense is really preventing things from getting in. Remember to cause uh, an infection, those stages. First, we have to get in, then we have to stay in uh, so that we can multiply as a pathogen um, to critical mass, to numbers that can then cause damage. So evade the host defenses to stay in and then cause some sort of damage. Our first line of defense is all about eliminating that first step of getting in um, and staying in. So we have physical barriers and chemical barriers. So things try to get in, we're surrounded, we're awash in pathogens uh, because they're everywhere. Um, but they rarely get in because of that first line of defense. Our second line of defense is to prevent that staying in part. And uh, we eliminate them as quickly as possible through uh, some pretty swift attack methods. And all of those, once something has breached our primary line of defense, that secondary line of defense starts to send out chemical messengers that activate uh, a faster and ever more aggressive response. So that ramps up pretty quickly to eliminate defenses. And it also goes into play to activate that adaptive response. So our first line of defense, really we have, uh, I think we covered this pretty well in the discussion, physical barriers, chemical barriers. So our sweat glands, uh, the, the pH of our sweat, our tears that contain lysozyme, an enzyme that breaks down, that is able to break down or lyse bacterial cells um, and viral envelopes. Our mucus can trap uh, pathogens can trap any kind of antigen to prevent them from getting in, uh, our perspiration, the wax in our ears, the saliva, all of these different barriers. Uh, stomach acid is a chemical barrier, enzymes in the intestine that break down things that don't belong, uh, the mechanical flushing of sweat, of urine, uh, all remove different uh, pathogens that try to get in through those pathways, through those portals of entry. It's my favorite just because it's got such a cool name, the mucociliary escalator. Uh, this protect, protects our upper respiratory tract to keep things out of the lung, out of the lungs. So our trachea is lined with uh, ciliated cells that continuously sweep upward uh, and the goblet cells lining these will produce mucus that will trap the bacteria. And then those cilia flush the bacteria up and out. Uh, so just 
quickly. You should be able to figure this out for each of the barriers below, state whether it's a physical or a chemical barrier. So hydrochloric acid in the stomach uh, is a chemical barrier. It attacks and breaks down any invaders, anything um, killing them. Sloughing of the skin, this is mechanical. It's, so it's a physical barrier where physically, as our skin continuously replenishes itself, the outer layers slough off, taking anything that's on that outer layer with it. Lysozyme, again, this is the enzyme that's found in saliva and tears. And that lysozyme, it's an enzyme that breaks down, that peptidoglycan breaks down uh, bacteria, viruses, or other invaders. The ciliary escalator, mucociliary escalator that we just talked about. It's a physical barrier. It physically traps and sweeps out the bacteria. And then urination. Uh, that could be urination, the physical process, that mechanical flushing is physical, uh, but the urine itself is chemical. All right, section 12.2, we start looking at uh, our second line of defense and some portions of the third. It's really difficult to separate the two because there's so much crossing over. There's so much feedback between the two and exchange um, where each part will activate something, the other part or respond with more of it and back and forth. Um, so in your concept maps, you should have a lot of crisscrossing and connections. Uh, none of the concepts in that map, none of the parts of the immune system act completely separately. All of them do something to either activate feedback or feed into some other response because this is really a quick spiraling up of how we attack and eliminate anything that comes in. Uh, so look at the, the phagocytes, our uh, mononuclear phagocyte system, which is really the white blood cells that are going to attack invaders um, and the lymphatic system role in immunity. Look at those blood cells. So our second line of defense, second and third lines both really have similar, um, similar functions. The difference being one is nonspecific, the other specific. Uh, and what their role is surveillance. So continuous circulation throughout the body, surveilling, going through, examining, touching everything they encounter. Um, so I like to think of it as they're out there going, do you belong? Yes, you belong, you belong, you belong. I recognize you, I recognize you. Oh, I do not recognize you as being part of me. Therefore, you are foreign material, you don't belong, and I must destroy you. So the surveillance, we have our white blood cells that are constantly um, circulating, constantly out there, coming into contact with other cells. Uh, if they find our own cells, they come into contact with self. They say, oh, I recognize you. I fit. You have the correct pattern on your surface uh, that my recognition protein acknowledges you belong here and there's no reaction. It's recognition, uh, they come across a pathogen and those pathogen associated molecular patterns on the surface are not self. So they recognize these as something that does not belong here. They detect those uh, foreign cells or viruses uh, and then proceed to destroy them uh, through phagocytosis. So let's quickly look at some of those blood cells involved. Um, hematopoiesis is the production of blood cells. And those blood cells are produced in the bone marrow. Our stem cells, these are preliminary blood cells. They don't know what type of blood cell they're going to differentiate into. They're considered pluripotent, pluri meaning many. They can, they have the potential to develop into any type of blood cell. Uh, but then when they differentiate, they will become whatever they're going to be as a mature cell. Uh, so some will differentiate into red blood cells, some into white blood cells, some into platelets. 
our white blood cells or the leukocytes uh, can also differentiate into a variety of different cell types. Some of these will be our mononuclear phagocyte system. Just, these are the cells that are the, uh, the precursors, the ones that are destined to develop into monocytes and macrophages. And our monocytes can then further differentiate. These are non-phagocytic cells that circulate. They circulate as um, non-phagocytic, just surveillance cells. And when they encounter an invader, they will differentiate into macrophages um, or dendritic cells, which are both um, phagocytic cells. We find an abundance of our phagocytic cells in the thymus. This is where some of our white blood cells are going to mature. Our T cells is part of the adaptive immune response. Uh, in the lymph nodes, we have high concentrations of these. Uh, in the tonsils, the spleen, and in the lymphoid tissue of the mucosa. So in the gut and the respiratory tract, those um, mucus producing cells that line those have high amounts of phagocytic cells for surveillance. Those are all close to, if you think the tonsils, uh, they're near potential portals, portals of entry. Our lymphoid tissue is concentrated highly around areas that are potential portals, portals of entry. So they're there close, ready to attack, ready to um, become activated. And here's our differentiation. Uh, so we start out as I have the ability to be any kind of cell. Then I'm going to differentiate into something that can become a lymphoid cell. These are those that mature in the lymph nodes or in the lymphatic system, in the thymus or the lymph nodes. So they will become B or T cells. And then we have, these are very specific. They're part of the adaptive response. We'll look at these next, but the... Um, in the next chapter. Uh, natural killer cells, they're related to our T cells. So they are lymphoid, they mature uh, in the lymphatic system, but they are not specific. These are um, sort of a cross, a, a go between. They don't have antigen specificity. They will respond to um, and release chemical signals to induce apoptosis, destruction in infected cells or cells that don't belong, viruses, um, cancer cells. Over on this side, our stem cells, once we've divided, we can now still become either a red blood cell or white blood cell or platelet. But the white blood cells, these are our leukocytes, and they have multiple stages of differentiation. Here, these are circulating white blood cells that go in relatively low concentration continuously. Our neutrophils are phagocytic. These are present in relatively high quantities, all the time circulating, um, ready to react. Basophils, these are involved in inflammatory events. They contain histamines in those granules. These are closely related to mast cells. They work in, con uh, in concert with each other. They're hard to differentiate which one is which, and they both have similar jobs. And then our eosinophils that are primarily active uh, with fungal and parasitic infections and helminthic infections with worms. So we see those, and also with some allergic reactions. But the basophils and mast cells are our biggies for allergic reactions. And then over here, uh, my monoblasts. These are the, mono, uh, the monocytes that are going to circulate in a non-phagocytic form until they encounter an invader. And then they can differentiate into macrophages. These are our largest macro, big, and phage. It's something that eats something else, eaters, so big eaters. They are going to engulf lots of pathogen. And our dendritic cells, these uh, tend to concentrate in our lymph nodes, move around, identify um, bacteria. These two are going to be our primary um, antigen presenting cells that are going to be the bridge that comes over here and activates our uh, lymph lymphocytes, our B and T cells. 
So our phagocytes are found in highest concentrations in areas near the portals of entry. Um, so we see here nose, mouth, prevent vital organs like the brain, or protect vital organs like the brain, heart and lungs, uh, reproductive organs. So we find them in really high concentrations in our spleen, which is where we clean our blood. So really high concentrations of them near uh, potential hotspots for infection. <clears throat> so our immune system is going to uh, look for markers on cell surfaces. And those mar markers tell them, yes, oh, that marker indicates this cell belongs here, or no, this cell does not belong here. It's got the wrong type of marker. Um, these markers are usually proteins, sometimes proteins with a sugar and glycoprotein attached that are on the cell surface uh, so that the immune system cells can identify, hey, is this, does this belong, does this not belong? And we have markers uh, on pathogens that are pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. So these are specific series of proteins or proteins and sugars that our immune system recognizes, hey, we don't have those, only the bad guys have them. So that's what they're looking for when they're doing surveillance. They're looking for PAMPs. Uh, we also have toll-like receptors. Those toll-like receptors and pattern recognition protein or pattern recognition receptors, these are similar. Uh, both of these, think of a toll as something where you come by and it lets you go or it doesn't. Uh, these receptors are saying, oh yes, okay, this is, this is correct. You can go on, you belong here. Oh no, you don't, let's destroy you. Uh, same thing with those pattern recognition receptors. They have similar jobs. Uh, they also, our immune system is trained early on to recognize, oh, okay, this is not my cell, but it's food. It's non-threatening. So this is not harmful. This can go on um, or this can stay in the system without inducing um, a more pronounced attack mode. So we learn to recognize not only um, harmful invaders, but foreign substances that, hey, this is okay, this is food, or this belongs here. Um, one thing to keep in mind, one of the things that makes this so hard, especially with our concept map and why a concept map is so much more useful than trying to read through in the order that we have to read, in order, straight through. Um, that, that map lets us see how complex and how diffuse um, and how kind of all-encompassing this system is. Our immune system is everywhere in our body. It's not a defined digestive system. I can track it. It goes mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum. Um, we can't, we can track this, but it's moving. It's a moving fluid dynamic uh, organ system that's everywhere. So it makes it kind of hard to talk about linearly because it keeps looping around. Um, the lymphatic system is considered, it has another primary purpose, but it is part of um, our immune system. It's a compartment, compartmentalized network of, of vessels, cells, and specialty, specialty organs. Uh, its primary role is to move fluids back into the circulatory system. And we're gonna see how those fluids can leak out when we talk about inflammation. That's fluid leaking out from our circulatory system. So we're gonna get that back in. Um, that lymph will be reincorporated into the circulatory system. And we have other lymphatic organs. Our thymus, which is located just above the heart, upper chest region, uh, which is where our T cells are going to um, to mature. And then we have these uh, high concentrations of lymphatic tissue, tonsils, uh, lymph nodes, our lymph nodes, we see heavy concentrations, again, where easy portals of entry are. Um, so near the nose and mouth, near breast tissue, uh, near hands and feet, near the groin area. Um, in the intestine. Uh, so we have lymph nodes there and then the spleen, which is going to be our filter. Uh, it's going to clean pathogens from the blood. 
So those are all, all play a role because our white blood cells are going to be heavily concentrated and located in those. Our thymus, our T cells are heavily located in those. And then within all the lymph nodes, we have our T and B cells, um, our immature T and B cells waiting to be activated when an invader is identified. Uh, so the thymus, here we go. This is uh, where our T cells develop their specificity and go into circulation. They go into circulation and they migrate to and they settle in the lymph nodes in the spleen waiting for activation. Our lymph nodes are congregated again in areas near common portals of entry. And then our spleen is going to be our filter. Lymphatic fluids contain all of the following except white blood cells, extra, extracellular fluids. Well, white blood cells, yep, they're going to be housed in uh, and circulate in our lymphatic fluid. Our extracellular fluid is carried back and put into circulation through the lymphatic system. Cellular debris is flushed out through the spleen. Infectious agents are carried to the lymph to activate our white blood cells. So the one that's not involved here are the red blood cells. They're gonna stay in circulation in our circulatory system. In the next section, we look at some of our specific non, our specific non-specific responses, how's that? Okay, we're gonna look at our non-specific immunity, the steps in it, um, phagocytosis, what exactly happens there, inflammation, fever, uh, and then the complement system. So our second line of defense really is composed of four nonspecific responses. Our phagocytes, we're gonna engulf and digest our invaders. Uh, we are going to show, have inflammation as a way to get more cells to infected areas, fever to try to eliminate the invaders uh, and help our own response, and then the complement system to destroy pathogens. So phagocytosis really is, this is the cornerstone of everything. Our phagocytes start the process. They connect to our specific response. They release chemical messengers that are going to amplify all of the responses. Um, so they really generate and direct a lot of what happens with our immune response. Their general or primary activities are to survey the tissues, looking for uh, pathogens for injured or dead cells, and then ingest and eliminate those materials, and also extract immunogenic information. So while they're surveilling, they are the ones that are going to find out exactly what it is uh, that's causing the problem, present that to our specific immune system, to our adaptive immune system say, this is our target. This is what we want to eliminate. Now our specific immune system, our adaptive immune system can target exactly what this specific pathogen is. So our non-specific phagocytes that are constantly in circulation, circulation surveilling for invaders are the ones who tell um, or inform our specific immune system, the adaptive immune system of what it is we are looking for. Uh, we have our neutrophils, the sort of general purpose phagocytes circulating just all the time, looking for an invader. When they encounter one, they can release cytokines, messengers saying, hey, we need some help here, uh, trigger inflammation. And then our monocytes, which are non-phagocytic, precursors to the macrophages in dendritic cells. These are the ones that are gonna process the antigens. So they engulf the invader, they process, they find the specific immunogenic portion, the antigen uh, that tells us what kind of antibodies to build. So antigen means um, the antibody generator. That's where you get antigen from. So uh, the mechanisms are phagocytes, they recognize invaders, engulf them, and kill them. 
That's how they act. The events of phagocytosis are chemotaxis. Uh, that is following a chemical trail, just like a bloodhound would follow a scent trail. Our phagocytes follow a chemical trail to get to where the invader or the injury is, ingest the invader um, or damaged cells from injury, form a phagolysosome, uh, which will destroy the invader. We'll talk more about the phagolysosomes and then excrete the waste to the circulatory system to be removed. So chemotaxis, uh, once at the site of infection or injury to a host, um, damaged cells, bacteria that we can release cytokines, uh, which leave a chemical trail uh, that guides those phagocytic cells in. Adhesion, we get our phagocytes adhering to the invader, and that's through that pattern recognition receptors with the PAMPs, with our pathogen-associated molecular patterns. They see each other and they adhere, we fit, we grab on. Endocytosis, so we talked about membrane transport uh, as a way to get in food and get out waste. Endocytosis, our phagocytic cells use that. That attachment, just like viruses get in, and we're going to um, form a vesicle by wrapping the membrane around and pulling the invader in and wrapping it in a membrane bound vesicle. Then our phagocytic cell, again, these are our cells, they're eukaryotic. So they are going to use the endoplasmic reticulum to form a lysosome, which is a membrane bound organelle that has digestive enzyme in it. Um, the lysosome is our cell's garbage disposal. It breaks down waste and excretes it. So here I have digestive enzyme in this vesicle. I have my invader in this vesicle and they fuse. So here is my phagocytic cell engulfing the pathogen. Here's my digestive enzyme. They fuse. I have a phagolysosome. Uh, the digestive enzyme does what it does, it destroys the invader. And at this point, we're also gonna do some processing. We're gonna eliminate that waste product through exocytosis, merging with the membrane and then eliminating that, um, releasing the garbage out of the cell to be removed through circulation. But during this process, my phagocytic cell is also going to identify something on that um, pathogen that is very specific, the antigen uh, or the epitope, which is the specific piece, usually some sort of protein or something that can be recognized as specific to this one invader. Uh, and then they will hang on to that to go and present it to my T cells. Right, so that's, those are the steps in phagocytosis. Um, the other part of my um, innate response is the inflammatory response, which is when there is damage. Uh, once I've identified an invader and processed it, my phagocytic cells, my neutrophils are going to release um, cytokines, chemical messengers, and that's going to activate uh, my um, immune system cells and my body cells to release histamine uh, and other cytokines that induce an inflammatory response. The inflammatory response, we see these words, uh, these signs and symptoms, these words are associated with the signs and symptoms we see, which are uh, redness, heat, swelling, and pain. So the rubor is redness, you see ruby in there. Uh, if you speak um, any of the Romance languages, but Spanish is a calor, heat. Two more is swelling and dolor is pain. Uh, and these all together in extreme cases, we can have loss of function with extreme inflammation. All of these have a role to play in 
we think of oh, inflammation as being something we want to get rid of, but it's actually a response to help our immune system eliminate the invader. Uh, so the redness is actually caused by an increase in circulation. We increase the blood flow. The more we get the blood flowing to that area, the faster all those white blood cells that can respond um, can get to the area, as well as the portions of our blood that are involved in clotting to fix and repair any damage. Calor, we get heat because that increased blood flow. Our blood is warm. It's coming from the inside of our body. We get that uh, heat because of, this, because of the redness or because of the increased circulation. We get that swelling because we're actually increasing circulation to that area, increasing all of our fluids going to that area. Uh, but we're also going to let typically our fluids, our blood is encased in our circulatory system in a series of vessels, we're going to let that seep out of those vessels can get into the damaged tissue. Um, and then that pain is actually caused because as all of those um, increased molecules, all of the fluids flood into that area, we're actually pressing against our bendings. So we feel pain as well. So the functions of inflammation are to mobilize and attract all the components of our innate immune system uh, to the site of injury and also to our of our adaptive immune system once that's activated. But we want everything that we need to respond and repair tissue to get there as quickly as possible. The inflammation does that. Um, it destroys microbes, prevents their further invasion by flooding everything into that area to react quickly, uh, including fibrin and, and clotting factors. So if there's tissue damage, we can start the repair process. Uh, the downside with all of these responses, we kind of balance this tightrope of the response is good and helps, but too much of it can potentially cause damage. So we actually have some microbes that have developed ways to elicit or expand that reaction. Uh, so inflammation that causes tissue damage, we have microbes that will find a way to increase the tissue damage um, as a way for them really to get more nutrients in most cases. So our inflammatory mediators, the things that trigger uh, and expand this response, our infl inflammation, are cytokines and chemokines. These are chemical messengers that are secreted by immune system cells. Uh, some of them are used to regulate the response. Some stimulate and ex accelerate it. Some say, okay, that's enough, back off. They control a lot of the responses. So many, almost all of our immune system cells are going to release some sort of chemical messengers uh, that are going to induce more response either from similar cells or from related uh, immune system cells. Uh, let's see. These serve as our go-between, so they amplify the innate response, and then they actually communicate to help trigger parts of the immune, the adaptive immune response. So our non-specific mediators, these are our different cytokines, a list of cytokines. I don't expect you to memorize all of these. They're just a couple that you should recognize. Um, so tumor necrosis factor, uh, macrophages, our phagocytes release these, they draw them in. These are the, the scent trail that our phagocytes follow to get to where the damage or the invasion is. Um, and these can also induce fever. Interferons, uh, we talked about those in our discussion. We'll look at those a little bit more in just a minute. And then histamines, everybody knows, oh, when you have an allergic reaction, um, we're going to take an antihistamine. What we're really trying to do is reduce the swelling and mucous membranes and tissues uh, where some invasion has taken place. But histamines are released by mast cells and basophils. Oops, let me go back. Um, and they cause vasodilation, our blood vessels to expand so that we can get more circulation, we can get more blood, we can flood those fluids to those area, uh, to the areas. So they're 
involved in inflammation because that's how we move all those fluids to the damaged or infected area. So those are the, the really three that you should um, you should recognize. Interleukin, we've got a number of different kind of interleukins that increase uh, fever as well. So inflammation, we have a series of very predictable stepwise um, a stepwise progression through the stages of inflammation when either there is damage to a tissue or uh, white blood cells have identified an invader. So uh, the site of initial injury, injured cells or white blood cells will release cytokines, our chemical messengers. Um, initially, it starts with vasoconstriction, which is the blood vessels shrink a little bit first. Uh, and then start to release those, those uh, chemokines. It's our chemical scent that the white blood cells are going to follow. So cytokines is sort of the, the big, broad chemical messenger types that were all of those cytokines. And then the chemokines are the specific ones that we're gonna follow our scent trail to bring in white blood cells. After that initial constriction of our blood vessels, um, which is to kind of try to prevent further damage, we're gonna dilate now because we know those white blood cells are coming in. So vasodilation, my blood cells are going to expand to get more fluid to that area. Uh, when they expand, the cells that actually make up those vessels will start to you know, pull apart. So they're gonna be little spaces in between, uh, which allows diapodesis, which is the white blood cells can actually squeeze out of the blood vessel into the surrounding damaged tissue. Uh, and so that fluid squeezes out, those white blood cells get to where the site of damage is or the site of infection. We get edema, which is swelling, pus formation. Uh, pus is just those white blood cells, uh, that have engulfed cellular debris, engulfed, uh, engulfed pathogens um, and killed them. So all of that together forms our pus. Um, so as I remove the damaged tissue, the cell debris, cellular debris, uh, I start to get pus formation. And again, remove that through circulation and through our spleen uh, and then repair. So the final step is resolution, where all those, along with all the other fluids that flood into the area, um, my components, my blood components involved, the proteins involved in clotting and, um, and scar formation will start to form. I'll either have scar tissue formed or through mitosis, I'll repair the area. And so those are the steps that I'm going to go through for inflammation. So we have immediate damage, my vascular reactions, which is where I get my blood cells in. I resolve the situation through that swelling, through the action of the white blood cells. And then we wrap things up and we repair the damage. This is just looking at, dio, at diapodesis, which is, as my blood vessels expand, what these white blood, blood cells are going to do, my phagocytes are going to roll along the outside. So they're gonna flow along the margins of the blood vessels following this trail, the chemotaxis. So as they find an area where, oh, here's where the scent is really strong, that dilation is gonna cause little gaps in between the cells forming the blood vessel, where my white blood cells can now squeeze out um, as they follow that trail. So this is marginalization as they travel along the margins or edges of the blood vessel, looking for where these gaps are, and those gaps will be where the highest concentration of my chemotactic factor, my chemokines are. And then we squeeze out to get to where the damage is. Uh, the third part of my or another part of my inflammation and adjunct to inflammation is fever. 
It's caused by pyrogens, so pyrogenic agents. It's different pyogenes in lab. Talk about uh, streptococcus pyogenes causes strep throat. Pyogenic is pus producing. Pyrogenic, the pyromaniac, you like fire pyrogens. Uh, reset our thermostat that's found in the hypothalamus. Uh, they set it to a higher setting to increase fever. We have exogenous pyrogens. So exo is from outside. So we can have pyrogenic agents that reset that thermostat that come from the infectious agent, from viruses, bacteria, um, from whatever the pathogen is. We also have endogenous pyrogens. These are our own cells that release um, cytokines that tell the hypothalamus, hey, let's increase the temperature a little bit. The reason we want to increase the temperature is because that increase can inhibit the multiplication of temperature sensitive microorganisms. Uh, bacteria in order to replicate, to reproduce and for metabolism need a certain level of iron. They're unable to absorb that iron becomes unavailable to them at higher temperatures. Uh, and it increases metabolism, increases the rate of circulation, increased temperatures, increased with, associated with increase in molecular mode, in the motion of molecules. So the speed that reactions take place at, we increase that speed, we increase uh, the movement of molecules of our cells to get to where they need to go. Um, so that increases our immune response. And again, balancing act. A little bit of fever can help us in all these ways. Too much for too long can cause tissue damage um, and organ damage. And so we need to kind of balance this out. Uh, one of the antimicrobial proteins that's released in this process that I mentioned, um, so cytokine is called interferon. Certain white blood cells and tissue cells can produce interferon. Originally thought it was directed specifically against viruses, but it actually, it's actually involved in a lot of cell-to-cell -cell communication um, once they've been invaded by a pathogen. And some of the things that interferon, interferons, these specific cytokines do, uh, especially for virus infected cells, but also tumors and bacterial infected cells. They can send a signal to, to their neighbors, tells the neighbors, hey, stop with the messenger RNA synthesis right now. So stop transcription, um, destroy RNA. As we learn, there are a lot of viruses that are RNA viruses. So just start destroying RNA uh, and limit protein synthesis. So these are parts of metabolism. I'm going to transcribe and then translate proteins that I need for metabolism. So we're just going to tell the neighbors, just wait on the metabolism. Because what a virus is going to try to do is get in here and take over that machinery. So let's just put a stop to the machinery right now. Uh, I will also send a message to say, uh, to promote apoptosis to say, hey, I'm infected, I'm not doing any good as long as the virus is inside me, the immune system can't get to it. So I am going to self-destruct. That'll release the virus out into circulation where my immune system cells can get it and uh, eliminate it. And it'll also send a signal um, to neighboring immune system cells saying, attack me, kill me. Uh, it is not a cure though. So once a cell is infected either with a virus or a bacteria, um, it can release interferon to try to protect neighboring cells that are no longer, or that are not yet infected. But this cell is pretty much gonna sacrifice itself when it does that. So it can stem the infection by saving other cells, but it's not gonna save cells that are already infected. All right, the last portion of the innate system I want to look at is complement system. Complement system is a series of about 30 different proteins that are constantly in circulation. So this is the innate immune system. It doesn't care what's out there. I've got these 30 proteins that are constantly circulating. Uh, and because they are constantly in circulation, they can activate immediately uh, as soon as they come into contact with a pathogen. 
and their major primary function is to wipe out bacterial cells or viral envelopes. Um, they do that through the membrane attack complex. So they can punch a hole in the viral envelope uh, and then break the virus apart or in the bacterial cell wall and membrane. So we have three different ways that we can activate the complement system's um, assault weapons. It's got some assault weapons it uses. Uh, we activate those proteins are constantly circulating, but to get them to actually attack an invader, we are going to have to encounter it. So our three different ways are the classical pathway, the alternative pathway, and the lectin binding pathway. The classical pathway is called the classical pathway only because it was the first pathway that was identified. Um, but it's part of the adaptive immune response because it uses antibodies. So the classical pathway activates only after we've already encountered an invader in the past and so we can recognize it. The alternative and lectin binding pathways are the two that are portions of the innate response. So complement is a bridge between adaptive and innate. So with the classical pathway, uh, complement proteins are going to bind to antibodies that recognize a microbe. We only have antibodies that recognize a microbe if we've already encountered it. So there's some pathogen that we've already seen before. We've already produced antibodies. So now, as soon as it enters, those antibodies that are constantly in circulation, these are going to, these are produced by our memory B cells, will activate, produce them instantly, ramp up their, uh, their production, but they're always in circulation after our first encounter with a pathogen. So they latch on and mark this microbe as, hey, we've seen you before. And my complement protein, also in circulation, binds to those antibodies and starts this cascade. And that cascade is basically a communication mechanism between these 20 proteins. Each of those 20 proteins has a different role. Uh, and so by binding, by the C1 protein binding, it activates the C2 and C4 proteins that go through a whole series of steps. Don't need to know the intermediate steps, but we know at some point this cascade of proteins being activated and doing something, whatever their response is, leads to the C3 protein being hydrolyzed. That means that C3 protein splits into two parts. One part becomes a cytokine that activates inflammation. And the other, the other portion is going to trigger obsonization and the membrane attack com complex, which will lead to cytolysis or the lysing of the cell. So obsonization, this means marking the pathogen, whatever it is, marking it for destruction um, by my phagocytes. So obsonization can occur in two ways. I can have the, um, the complement proteins just all go and grab on to microbes, and it kind of gives a handle or makes them more visible, easier for my phagocytes to grab onto. Um, or I can have antibodies coat the outside of the pathogen. Again, they work like handles and my phagocytes can grab onto them. So absinization is really just marking for destruction by phagocytes. And then the MAC complex are nine of these complement proteins coming together to form, I always think of it as a hole punch. Right? So they're gonna form this ring that works like a hole punch and it's gonna punch through, hear me punch my table. It's gonna punch a hole through the membrane. And that membrane can be the envelope on envelope viruses uh, or the membrane and the cell wall of a microbe. The alternative pathway, this is part of the innate system. I'm, don't have to have seen the pathogen before. I don't need antibodies already preformed. Uh, just three of the complement proteins latch on to these PAMPs to the outer surface of microbes. They recognize those, uh, those patterns that are associated with my various pathogens and they latch on 
And when they do that, those three complements trigger that C3 cascade, hydrolyze the C3, and we get inflammation through the action of C3A as a cytokine, increase inflammation, flood that area with my response. Um, and then opsonization, we mark them for destruction with uh, complement proteins and the MAC complex. We punch holes in them and get rid of them. And then the final one, again, part of the innate system is the lectin binding pathway. Mannose is a sugar that's found on the surface of pathogens and parasites, but our own normal healthy eukaryotic cells do not have mannose on the surface. So some of those complement proteins are specifically mannose binding proteins. That's what they recognize. Uh, once they have recognized that and surround or latch onto the surface of the invader, they trigger that C3 hydrolysis. It splits into two. One part goes off and stimulates inflammation and the other part triggers formation of the membrane attack complex. Uh, and other proteins grab onto the invaders to mark them for destruction by phagocytes, so obsonization. So those are my three different ways that the complement system attacks. So that three-pronged approach um, can really spiral up quickly. This is a crazy effective way to eliminate any pathogens. This is the membrane attack complex. You can actually see this. Um, poking holes in the membrane, and these are some of the some of the holes it pokes through. Um, there's my hole punch right there. All right, and those those are kind of the highlights of my innate immune response. Um, and I will try to get the chapter thirteen uh, video lecture up by the end of the day. Thank you.